Passage 3. This passage is adapted from Emily Monison, Evolution in a Toxic World, How Life Responds to Chemical Threats. It says UVB radiation can damage DNA. Makes sense. DNA photolase is an enzyme that can repair DNA damage. So that's the background information. It starts out by telling us about Andrew Blaustein. He's an ecologist. He studied frogs. Particularly, he's looking at the role of UV radiation in population declines, and then starts talking about frog species. What they do is they lay their eggs in sunlit ponds or puddles, relying on the sun's energy for various benefits, egg hatching, larval development. But much like photosynthesis or vitamin D production, it's a trade-off. What does that mean? Faster development in a higher risk environment, I guess because they're more exposed to predators. And then the last point that they make is that amphibians have a lot of defenses against UVB radiation, um, but here it seems that particular interest is the redundant systems for DNA repair, meaning DNA photolase. To examine how photolase works and how UVB exposure works, the two people, Blaustein and co-author Lisa Belden, they compared the life history habits of amphibian species with the DNA photolase activity in their eggs. What were the results? Their study reveals strong positive correlations between UVB resistant frog species, i.e. the ones who lay their eggs in sunlight, and increased photolase activity. So it seems like the photolase is in fact protecting them. And they kind of summarize that in line 32. In other words, frog species that lay their eggs in sun-drenched environments are better able to repair DNA damage caused by UVB. It looks like that this was confirmed in another study in which the Pacific uh, tree frogs were the most resistant and they also had the highest concentration of photolase. And then the last part of it just goes to talk about other um, potential damage that's done by UVB exposure. That brings up a question they're saying. Are less resistant species more susceptible to DNA damage caused by increased UVB? Because keep in mind, we're comparing more resistant species who lay their eggs in the sun to less resistant species who don't. The next paragraph says that this question was answered in part by researchers working with a single species of frogs inhabiting a different altitude of the French Alps. So what's uh, unique about these frogs at the higher altitudes? It says they have naturally higher UVB exposures and show less DNA damage than their lower altitude brethren. So the question is, what is the mechanism or what is the reason? And they propose rapid evolution, increased protein production, or both. And that's something that they're going to have to answer. Why do they not know the reason now? It's in line 57 because DNA photolase concentrations were not measured. However, there's going to be evidence that suggests that that's uh, the reason in part. So what they did was they looked at DNA damage not caused by UVB, but DNA damage caused by this benzopyrene carcinogen that is found in everyday places. What it does is it says it binds with DMA, DNA causing a kink in the helix, just like UVB. And one of the things that DNA photolase does is repairs that DNA. So what were the results? High altitude frogs had less BAP induced DNA damage compared with their lowland cousins. So possibly it was the DNA photolase that gave them protection. Again, because they didn't measure the DNA photolase concentrations, you don't know that directly but that's what the theory is now. And that's why it says in the line 72, until those enzyme concentrations are confirmed, any added protection cannot yet be attributed to increased DNA photolase. Question 22, based on the passage, which situation most similar to that described in lines 10 to 13? So let's look at 10 to 13. Line 10, much like photosynthesis or vitamin D, it's a trade-off. In the frog's case, faster development in a high-risk environment. So that's what we're looking for, something that is a trade-off. Uh, choice A, a male elk that expends considerable energy to grow large antlers. Uh, that might be similar. Uh, I'm not really sure if this is a trade-off or more of an investment, so we'll keep it in for now. Choice B, uh, 
a deer that forages in an area with plentiful resources and in close proximity to predators. So this is definitely closer to what we read in the passage because they're getting more, but they're also in danger because of their environment. So this one seems more likely than A, C. A bird that experiences rapid bone growth while losing bone strength. Again, you could consider this kind of a trade-off, but it's not as close to the trade-off or the type of trade-off that we saw in the passage as choice B. Choice D, a turtle that produces a small clutch of eggs because resources are scarce. This seems more just like a limitation of resources. Resources are scarce and that leads to a small clutch of eggs. So the best choice seems to be B. Question 23. The passage indicates that burrowing in mud may benefit some amphibians by... So if you remember, the comment about burrowing in mud was in line 16. It says, in addition to behavioral changes like burrowing in mud or laying eggs in logs, amphibians have redundant systems for DNA repair, including DNA photolase. So this is an example of ways that in line 14, amphibians are well defended against UVB radiation. In other words, they protect themselves or their, uh, their eggs by burrowing in mud. So let's go through the answer choices. Choice A, delaying egg hatching and larval development. So burrowing in the mud doesn't actually delay it, or at least there's no indication of it, so we'll cross that out. Repairing damage caused by UVB. This is a possibility. The question is, does burrowing in mud repair the damage or does it just protect it like the passage had said? Choice C, limiting their exposure to sunlight. This one seems a little bit better because by burrowing in the mud, they're protecting themselves from UVB, which obviously does come from sunlight. So C seems like a better choice than B. D, reducing their need to produce sunscreen. I don't think sunscreen was ever mentioned in the whole passage. Uh, regardless, the protection does come from the photo lace, not sunscreen. So D is out. Questions 24 and 25 should be done together. So let's look at the answers briefly. Based on the passage, it can most reasonably be, be inferred from the research conducted in the French Alps that... So remember that the research in the French Alps focused on a single species of frogs. They found that at the higher altitudes, there was higher UVB exposure, but less DNA damage, but they weren't really sure why. They think it was the DNA photolase, and they used the benzopyrene uh, carcinogen to sort of indirectly suggest that. Choice A. Living at higher altitudes affects larval growth and development. I don't think there was any mention of larval growth and development, so likely not. B, high levels of UVB exposure cause lethal effects in all altitudes. That's probably true, but I don't think that their experiment exactly uh, showed that or was looking at that. If anything, the, uh, the uh, species of frogs were doing really well. C, DNA photolase concentrations are naturally higher in the species of frog that were studied. If you remember back in the passage, they actually did not measure the DNA photolase concentrations based in line 57 right over here. So C is definitely not the answer. D, tolerance to UVB exposure can vary within a species. That might be true if you remember, so we'll just keep it. Question 25, now the evidence. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? Keep in mind the question is, what can we reasonably infer from the research conducted in the French Alps? Lines 47 to 49. The question was answered in part by researchers working with a single species of frogs inhabiting different altitudes of the French Alps. So given the fact that the researchers were working with a single species in the French Alps, does that le uh, reasonably lead to any of these? It doesn't look like it, so we'll say choice A is out. Choice B, lines 49 to 54. Line 49, frog populations adapted to life at higher altitudes and therefore naturally higher UVB exposure show less DNA damage than did their lower altitude brethren when exposed to UVB intensities typical of high altitude. So based on that sentence, D does seem like it can be reasonably inferred that tolerance to UVB exposure can vary within a species, particularly we know species by the word brethren that they used in the passage. So right now, D seems like the right answer for 24, and B seems like the right answer for 25. Let's go to choice C, line 54 to 56. This is the next sentence. 
Identifying the genetic mechanism of this adaptation, rapid evolution, increased protein production, or both, will require further study. So they're basically just saying they don't know yet. And based on the fact that they don't know anything, it doesn't seem like any of these can be naturally inferred from that. Choice D, lines 57 to 60. That's the next sentence. Although DNA photolase concentrations were not measured, the authors report an interesting twist that suggests the increase photolyse activity in high altitude tadpoles. Looking at the answer choices, the fact that the photolase was not measured, though there's an interesting twist, doesn't really lead to concluding any one of these choices. So we're left with D for 24, and we're left with B for 25, and that's the answer. 26, as used in line 61, experience most nearly means. So starting line 60, Interested in other ways frogs might experience DNA damage, they studied the effects of blah, blah, blah. So what does it mean to experience DNA damage? It's obviously not like experiencing anything fun. So my best guess words would be interested in ways that frogs might get DNA damage, that might they suffer DNA damage, they might obtain DNA damage or acquire DNA damage all has this sense that they didn't have it before and now they do. So let's look at it. Undergo, certainly a good choice. B, practice DNA damage, doesn't make any sense. C, withstand DNA damage. That would mean that they were almost gonna get damaged but then they were able to resist it. Definitely the opposite of what they're saying. Feel DNA damage. So, I mean, the question of can they feel the DNA damage is a completely different one from whether they objectively got DNA damage or not. So D would be your closest, but not really. So A is the answer. Now 27 and 28 should be done together, so let's go through 27 rather quickly. It can be reasonably inferred from the passage that if further research demonstrated that DNA photolase protected the high altitude frogs from BAP induced damage, then Pacific tree frogs should the one thing to keep in mind about Pacific tree frogs in 39 is that they were the most resistant and they also had some of the highest uh, concentrations of DNA photolase. So let's go through the answers. A, demonstrate a similar ability to cope with BAP pollution. So yeah, if the high altitude frogs uh, were protected by the DNA photolase, then the low altitude frogs who also had that would probably be protected. A seems very reasonable. B, thrive in high altitude habitats in the French Alps despite the, cli the changing climate. Well, they would be protected from the uh, UVB rays because of their DNA photolase, but what about other variables, cold temperatures, other predators? B, not as strong as A, we can keep it around. C, exhibit BAP induced damage only when exposed at high altitudes. That doesn't make sense at all because the high altitude frogs were protected and the premise is that it was by the photolase and if the other guys have it then they're not going to get damaged when they're up there. D, produce tadpoles that have clear evidence of kinks in their DNA helices. Also doesn't really make sense because if the DNA photolase is protecting them from those kinks then the Pacific tree frogs who have a lot of it should also be protected. So, Question 28, now we're looking for the proof. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer? So very simply we're looking for proof that the Pacific tree frogs could cope with the BAP or could live in high altitudes simply because they have a lot of DNA photolase. So let's look at the answers. Choice A, 25 to 31. 25, their study reveals strong positive correlation between the UVB resistant frog species to sunlight and increased photolase activity. This just says that there's, an in that there's a relationship between photolase activity and the species that are in the sun. It doesn't say anything about BAP, it doesn't say anything about high altitude, so A is out. Choice B, lines 43 to 46. So line 43, their findings raise an intriguing question. Are less resistant species more susceptible to DNA damage caused by increased UVB? So Pacific tree frogs are not the less resistant species, they're the ones that actually have high resistance, so uh, choice B doesn't actually have anything to do with them, so we're gonna cross that out. Choice C, lines 60 to 64. Interested in other ways frogs might experience DNA damage, they studied the effects of the BAP, a well-characterized carcinogen present in cigarette smoke, coal tar, oil, and myriad other combustion products. 
So that's just a statement about them studying BAP. Again, it doesn't offer any proof that the Pacific tree frogs would be able to cope with it or live in high altitude environments. So let's look at choice D, line 66 to 70. Activated BAP binds with DNA, causing a kink in the DNA helix, just like UVB. A specialty of the DNA photolase is kinky DNA. It turns out that high altitude frogs have less BAP induced DNA damage compared with their lowland cousins. So this is the connection that we were actually looking for. BAP is actually just like UVB and it causes a kink in the DNA and DNA photolase, one of its specialties, is kinky DNA. So based on this, it stands to reason that the Pacific tree frogs with a lot of DNA photolase should be able to cope with the BAP pollution because that's what the high altitude frogs are presumably doing, though it hasn't been demonstrated directly yet. So choice D is the answer for 28. Question 29, as used in line 72, confirmed most nearly means, so let's look at 72. It says, until enzyme concentrations are confirmed, any added protection cannot yet be attributed to increased DNA. So what do they mean? Remember that the enzyme concentrations were not measured in line 58. So obviously we're looking for a word here like measured or determined or made known. Choice A, administered. Administered means to like give out, so that doesn't make sense. Approved. That doesn't make sense either. Verified is a possibility. And strengthened also doesn't make sense for results because we don't know what they are. So C is the answer. Keep in mind that verified does imply that they are already there, even though it's not known. But the passage does give good reason why it seems likely that they would be. Question 30, which statement is best supported by the data in figure one? So looking at figure one, basically it says photolase activity, egg laying location, and exposure to sunlight in selected amphibian species. So basically you have a list of species, the amount of photolase activity, and then two things, egg laying location and exposure to sunlight, which are obviously related. One thing to notice about this is that the smaller the number or the smaller the measure of the photolase activity, the less exposure there is. 0 0.01, they're under stones or unexposed. 0.75, they're in open shallow water with high exposure. That's true for frogs and generally true for salamanders also. Choice A, only those amphibian species whose photolase activity less than or equal to 0.7 lay their eggs where there's no exposure to sunlight. That seems generally okay. We'll keep it for now. We may actually have to check this if there's something similar, but if all the answers are obviously wrong, then we don't. Choice B, all amphibian species with photolase activity greater than 3.5 lay their eggs in locations with high exposure to sunlight. So this is something we'll have to check. Amphibians greater than 3.5. So there's really only three species that are higher or equal to 3.5 and we just need to find one that contradicts it. So obviously Rana Aurora has variable exposure, which means B is not the right choice. Choice C, only those amphibian species with photolase activity 7.5 or greater lay their eggs in areas with variable exposure to sunlight. So again, there's only one species with 7.5, that's Hyla regilla, and what is the exposure? It's high exposure to sunlight, not variable, so that eliminates choice C. Choice D, all amphibian species with photolase activity of one or greater lay their eggs in open, shallow water. Again, we just need to find one that contradicts this, and that can be Hyla cadaverina or Hyla aurora. Notice they both have photolase activity greater than one, and for cadaverina, it says it's attached to debris near the surface, rana aurora attached to submerged stem, so neither of them are in open, shallow water, and the answer is going to be A. Question 31, according to figure one, which species lays its egg in locations with the greatest exposure to sunlight? So you basically just have to go through each of them. Hyla cadaverina, it says exposed. We'll just make a note of that. Rana aurora, it says variable exposure. So it's a little less than exposed. 
Agua Regilla, high exposure. So, so far that one is in the lead. And Ambistoma gracile, some exposure. So that means choice C is the highest and that'll be the answer. Question 32, which data from figure two appear to be inconsistent with the researchers' observations about the frog populations in the French Alps as presented in the passage? So in lines 49, it says, the frog populations adapted to life at higher altitudes and therefore naturally higher UVB exposures showed less DNA damage than their lower altitude brethren. That's the main idea from the French Alp experiment. The higher you go, the less DNA damage because of some type of adaptation. Looking at figure two, it says micronucleated erythrocytes as an indicator of DNA damage. That's on the y-axis. So you can basically just think of this as the amount of damage and on the x-axis, altitude. So basically what we see, what we should expect to see is that the higher the altitude, the less damage. And that's generally true for heights from 450 to 2450 not true for 294 up to 450. So likely our answer is gonna be something concerning this upward trend. All right, choice A, the population at 800 meters above sea level without exposure experienced less DNA damage than the population at 450 meters without exposure. So choice A, I can eliminate immediately because we're comparing two populations without exposure and the experiment at the French Alps really was concerning those species with exposure. Choice B, the population 410 meters above sea level without exposure experienced less DNA damage than the population 410 meters above sea level with exposure. That actually makes sense because if they don't have exposure, they're not going to get damaged as enough. But again, um, populations without UVB exposure were not really a focus of the French Alps experiment, so we'll cross out B. Choice C, the population at 800 meters above sea level with exposure experienced more damage than the population at 294 meters with UVB exposure. So let's look back at the graph. We're comparing the population with exposure at 800 compared to the population with exposure at 290. Notice that the 800 is higher, which is not what we would expect from the French Alps experiment because they said the higher you go, the less damage there should be. So C seems like a possible answer for now. Let's look at choice D. The population at 450 meters above sea level with exposure experienced more damage than the population at 200, uh, 2450 meters above with exposure. So we're comparing with and with at 450 and 2450. 450 and 2450. Again, the higher we go, the lower the exposure. So this does fit the pattern. So choice D does go along with the French Alps results, so that's not gonna be it. And choice C is our answer.